So, John Redwood, welcome to GB News. Well, good evening and uh, a big welcome to all your audience. And I look forward to discussing the future of our country and how we can take the opportunities that Brexit presents. I don't feel I've finished yet at all. I think we're just beginning. Uh, yes, we're now technically out of the EU. Yes, they can no longer impose new laws upon us, apart from perhaps in Northern Ireland, which remains to be resolved. But what I want is to start to get the benefits, and that means changing things for the better here at home. Is the political will at number 10 there to actually grasp the opportunities of Brexit, Sir John? Well, I trust it will be. I mean, there's no point in doing Brexit unless you wish to enjoy the freedoms and show that you can do things better. And I think they have already grasped one of the very big immediate freedoms that Brexit offered, uh, which was the government and the NHS decided to go our own way on the vaccines. They rejected the offer of staying within the European Union scheme. As a result, the UK made a vital contribution to the scientific and medical development of new vaccines and produce one of the first and the cheapest and I think a great vaccine and then got on with vaccinating the UK much more quickly than most other countries around the world. And we were able to do that because we took the lead, our scientists were great, our business people were great, they came together, we had domestic production rather than relying on imports and so we got ahead and started to save lives and make it easier for us to get back to work. So I think we've already had one win, not the one we wanted to have because we, we didn't want the pandemic, but it was a very good illustration of how being an independent country gave you more options. But I want to now start enjoying the benefits of taking VAT off things that, that should never have been put on in the first place, uh, repatriating our fish properly and then growing a decent home industry that's mm. kinder both to the fishermen and women and to the fish, and it wouldn't be difficult to be kinder to both compared with the common fisheries policy. Uh, I want us to do much more domestic farming. I think we need to cut the food yes. miles and to stop uh, transiting an awful lot of food from places like Spain that are very short of water into the United Kingdom, where we seem to have rather more <laughs> uh, water readily available, uh, and where I think we could rebuild our agricultural industry after years of the common agricultural policy. Uh, laying waste some parts of it and switching from a lot of domestic production to, to import. And I Absolutely. think if there's a single thing that unites me and many Brexiteers, it's the feeling that we can have more and better paid jobs in the United Kingdom mm. if we choose our own laws, sort out our own taxes uh, and buy more of our own products and, and services. And I think there's a winning market to do that. I think the supermarkets are finding it quite difficult to keep up with all the demand for British fruit and British vegetables and, and British meat and so forth that is definitely out there. Uh, and so the government needs to help. It needs to uh, refashion our agricultural policies so that we grow more at home and cut the food miles. Well, I agree with you there. We don't need to import apples. Anyone that's been to Kent will know that is very much the case. We don't need to import beef or lamb or cheese or beer come to that. Do you think, though, Sir John, there are still remain forces within the government, perhaps, within the civil service that uh, will resist an attempt to transform the nature of our economy and our society? Yes, I think there are quite strong remain forces within the wider governing establishment, which includes the civil service and the quangos and some of the big businesses, often global businesses, that advise people in government. Uh, and I think that is a great problem because I think they belittle the United Kingdom by thinking that we can never come up with a better answer or by thinking that we should always import the answer or, more importantly, import the goods or services from the European Union rather than uh, venturing ourselves at home. And I think we, we have to go on an educational process. I understand it was a shock for people who were very strongly of the Remain faith. They really didn't think they were going to lose uh, and we need to show them that it could be better, not worse, that we, we uh, really do believe in our country for good reasons. Uh, and that if we start to use those freedoms and trust ourselves more and rely on imports less, we're, we're going to have a more prosperous economy, a better society, a more balanced economy. Uh, but I think there is still an educational process to do. I, I note that some departments still seem to want to either keep all the EU legislation that we have temporarily kept or, or they even wish to import some of the new EU-style legislation that 
drives on, which we no longer, of course, have to, uh, to copy or follow in Great Britain itself, uh, whereas we should be saying, well, which of this legislation can we improve? Which don't we need? Uh, how can we have new laws that make sense for the, the problems of today and the problems of the United Kingdom? And one area, for example, was that and business and government all agreed that the port regulations and the merchant shipping regulations were either unnecessary in the UK or, or were damaging to the UK ports and merchant shipping industry over the years. Uh, and yet we still haven't stripped those out. Well, surely that should be something we should be doing as a priority. We are a great seafaring nation. Uh, I think we could have a bigger merchant marine uh, if we took some tax and legislative decisions. I think we could have more flourishing ports and port industries. And the government is now looking at free ports and at looking at where which it can extend businesses in or around ports in a digital age. You can have a virtual free port related to a seaport or an airport. It, doesn't have to be uh, a limited tract of land demarked by fences or something. Uh, so I think we need to get inventive and say these are the kinds of wins, uh, but you can strip out the EU regulation first to make it easier. Compromises clearly were needed uh, in order to achieve a comprehensive free trade agreement with the European Union. It happened. It was signed off on Christmas Eve, a perfect Christmas present for Brexiteers like yourself. But would you accept that the fishing industry in this country were the ones who were sacrificed to get that deal across the line? Well, I was one of only two Conservative MPs who didn't vote for the final deal because I, I found the clauses in it about Northern Ireland, which had been largely crafted for the withdrawal agreement, but we were promised that they were going to be amended when we got to the future relationship agreement, and they weren't. And the state of the fishing industry with the long transition and no very firm final resting place. I'm afraid that wasn't good enough. Uh, I'm now urging the government to go back to sort those out. And I think in the case of Northern Ireland trade, the position is very serious. I think there's a deliberate attempt by the EU to wrestle trade from GB to Northern Ireland and to turn it into EU to Northern Ireland trade to face people with, with an impossible situation unless they start buying um, from the EU rather than from ourselves. Mm. And that is upsetting the loyalist majority in Northern Ireland for understandable reasons. So it is destabilizing our very important constitutional settlement there, which has to be very balanced for obvious reasons. So I, I'm now saying to the government, I think you've got to take unilateral action. I think the, the action of the EU is unilateral and is questionably illegal because uh, all of the agreement says that they're going to respect our single market as well as we respect their single market. But I'm afraid they're not respecting our single market. They're making it very difficult, even for a UK supermarket, uh, to, to direct a container and a truck um, uh, over the sea lanes from GB to Northern Ireland when all the product on, on the truck or, or in the container is going to a store in Northern Ireland and is properly part of our internal UK market and has absolutely nothing to do with the EU. Well, I say if you've got that kind of trade, that is the bulk of the GB Northern Ireland trade, we regulate that, we control that, we shouldn't allow the EU to intervene and make it, making it expensive, creating delays or even making it impossible. I think it's quite wrong. Uh, and I think if they won't agree sensible propositions, and uh, various of us have put propositions forward to the government which would work, then I think the government must just impose a working solution which is within the spirit and uh, some of the language of the Northern Ireland Protocol, which does say very early on that the EU will respect our single market. Uh, would that involve triggering Article 16 and essentially tearing up the Northern Ireland Protocol and eliminating that invisible border down the Irish Sea which divides our country? Well, that's a matter for the lawyers and government ministers. I, mean, I, I don't think you necessarily need to trigger Article 16. I think you can argue quite convincingly, as I've just been trying to do in headline terms, uh, that the EU is not respecting the agreement as signed and certainly not the spirit of the agreement as defined in the, in the negotiations, uh, where very clearly they said that they understood we were going to be an independent sovereign country and they understood that uh, we had our own internal market, which we needed to police and to, to nurture. And I do think their actions uh, violate our internal market. And so I think we, we'd be quite within our rights to 
correct those areas where there is no damage and no goods passing through us to the EU, we should be in charge of that trade. Sir John, you entered the House of Commons in 1987. Why are you a Conservative? Well, I'm a Conservative because I, I believe that government should only do those things which just government can do, uh, that it should support those in need and should help those who, who find marketplace competition difficult, but it should allow everyone else more freedoms to make their own choices, to set up their own companies, to go and work for other people's companies, to, to build their own careers without the government bossing us around too much or without the government taking too much of the money which we, we earn as a result of our hard work. So I, I believe in a strong state because you need a good rule of law and a good, good framework for, for trade and to protect people's lives and legitimate interests. I believe in uh, a decent state which makes help and support available to those who are ill or disabled or, or are having bad luck in their lives. Uh, but I believe that most people rightly can cope for themselves, can look after their families, can make sensible choices. And I don't want a government that tries to boss us all around all the time uh, or a government that thinks it can take away too much of the profits of success for, for many people, which might just drive them out of the country or might mean they, uh, they strive rather less than they otherwise would do. Have you therefore been surprised, Sir John, to see this Conservative government handle the pandemic in a very unconservative way, crashing the economy, closing once vi viable businesses and paying people to stay at home, which is basically communism? Uh, well, <laughs> uh, I have surprised some people because when I saw what they were going to do, that the, the health imperative they'd identified meant uh, that there was going to be a, a big drop in social contact and people couldn't necessarily go to work when I saw that was going to happen. I was one of those who very early on argued that you then needed to inject a lot of money into the economy, uh, unusually for me, but you did need to do that to offset the obvious economic damage that was going to happen when maybe a quarter of the country's economy was effectively closed down, all those things that needed social contact and weren't absolutely essential. Uh, entertainment and leisure and hospitality and quite a lot of retail and so forth, when that was all going to be shut down, you needed a big offset. So I was actually one of those who said, have a big offset and, and suggested various ways that you could legitimately route money to people who had temporarily lost their job or lost their business, but where, where it would return. I think it's a bigger question about how did you respond and how was it right to respond to the, the pandemic? And, and again, I think I'm sympathetic that in the early stages where you didn't know how serious it was going to be and where there were no known treatments, let alone no known vaccines, and you didn't know how, how long it was going to take uh, before you could get on top of this thing, uh, I could understand the health imperative and strong actions were taken, along with many other countries around the world. Subsequently, I was one of those MPs who said, I think you can relax more quickly. And the more that we vaccinated people, uh, the more that I and others have said to the government, surely now you can relax because people have an option. But well, indeed, we've all got two or three options. So, uh, quite a lot of us have decided to take the option of the double vaccine. It looks as if it works pretty well. And then we can go about our business in a more normal way without being rash and without too much danger. But if, if you really don't like vaccines for one reason or another, uh, then you can, of course, decide to lead your life with far fewer social contacts. And we now have an online world and many people would be able to persuade their employer that they can do quite a lot of their work online. Uh, and you can certainly entertain yourself at home with downloaded entertainment and you can now get many of your deliveries online. So there is an option for people who don't want the vaccine, but who are uh, afraid of, of the virus still. So I think given that there are those two perfectly viable options for people to cut risks very substantially, uh, I'm very much in favour of opening up. And then as we open up, um, then I want to get rid of all the furlough payments. Yeah. I think you can afford to do that for a bit uh, because you've collapsed the economy and you can get away with very low interest rates and with actually creating some money to deal with that kind of problem. But you can't go on doing that. You, if you do, you will have an inflationary situation on your hands uh, and you, you've got serious trouble. So I, I'm, I'm very much of the view that let's get back to normal, near as normal as possible. 
uh, and then we don't need all these special payments anymore because people will be earning their living and businesses will be um, making money again. Do you think that sage advisors have a have had a disproportionate influence on government policy? And I mean, I accept your point, and I think we can all largely agree that when the pandemic began, the virus was an unknown quantity. And as you said, if you're going to make people stay at home, then it does make sense to support the economy and preserve jobs. And it does look like the furlough scheme was successful in doing just that. Um, but do you think that SAGE had been too powerful? And do you look enviously to countries like Sweden, who perhaps you could argue took a more conservative approach, which is to let people judge the risk for themselves? Well, I, I prefer that solution. I think we're, we're going to have to have kind of global inquiry or a series of complementary national inquiries, probably. And then we will get closer to the truth about what was the least bad way of handling this thing. I mean, I poured over a lot of the global figures. Now, the first problem we have with the global figures is we don't know how accurate they are because different countries have a different definition of what is a COVID death. and They have different rates of testing and they have uh, different degrees of reliability in compiling all the figures. Uh, but to the extent that you can trust official figures worldwide, there is no simple correlation between early, long and tough shutdown and low incidences of the disease or a more relaxed attitude and high incidences. If only there were, it would be a lot easier to know what you had to do. That just isn't the position. And there are some big un unanswered questions that come out of the data for me. I mean, one of the questions I keep asking people is, why is it that the Balkans and Hungary uh, in Europe, and then why in Western Europe, why is it Belgium that has had such a high case and death rate compared with many other countries? Uh, why has Germany had a such apparently low case and death rate. What was different there, if, if anything? Um, and why was it that the Asian countries didn't really suffer very much in the first wave at all, even though they didn't have vaccines? So I think we do need rather more informed information. As to the balance, uh, yes, I think um, more recently, when I and others have been saying, look, we can go a bit faster, we're getting back to normal, I have felt that the balance at the top um, for the decision takers has been too heavily in favour of the perfectly legitimate aim of trying to control the virus. But I'm afraid governments have to do more than just control a virus. Uh, they've got to stop suicides. They've got to make sure other kinds of health treatments are possible in the hospitals. They've got to make sure that uh, people can earn a living and that they, they have enough money for their food and their rent. So you've got to balance these things. Uh, and that's why I and others are saying to the government that let's move the balance a bit more now in favour of economic recovery, of, of getting the recovery of the health service for all the non-COVID treatments. And one of the issues I, I've been raising throughout the COVID period is to say, why couldn't we have isolation hospitals? Why didn't they use the Nightingales and keep them permanently during the COVID outbreak as uh, proper isolation hospitals? Or, or why couldn't you, particularly in urban areas with more than one hospital, why couldn't you have a COVID hospital and then keep the other hospitals safe for other treatments? Because clearly cross-infection was a big issue and controlling cross-infection has been an issue. And then I've also been saying over COVID, both to public and private sectors, NHS and wider, um, as you think quite a lot of this is transmitted through airflows, uh, have we done all we can do uh, in controlled spaces on, on air extraction? Uh, and are we using the airflow systems that buildings have already got correctly, or can they be tweaked? Uh, can you have um, an ultraviolet filtration system around the back, um, obviously not in front of, front of people's view, mm. uh, but where you're recirculating air, can you clean the air up with a UV filter or something? I saw that in China they were using UV cleaners, intense UV light quite a lot to, to treat surfaces there. So that I think one needs to have more work on the whole airflow system for controlling the, the spread of the virus in controlled spaces, because we need to get back to being able to use controlled spaces. And, and, and Sir John, before safely. I, with the clock against us and before I get to my brilliant viewers' questions, um, would you take a position in Parliament that we never lock down again, that lockdowns should not be the default mechanism whenever cases rise? No, I, would, I very rarely say never in politics because I, I know <laughs> long experience that then you get a really hard case and you may need to adjust it. I think you, you look at the circumstances and the evidence in each case and decide 
what is best to do. But I mean, the other thing that I, I'm very keen on is that I think we need uh, a new economic policy framework. Uh, and the government is now consulting on a new framework, I'm pleased to say. Uh, and what I'm saying to them is, yes, we need a strong inflation target. We've got an inflation target bank, which has a reasonable degree of independence. Let, let's stick with that. Uh, we clearly need that. Uh, we have a target which doesn't bite very much, but it's a perfectly good target that we shouldn't have debt interest as too high a proportion of the amount of tax revenue we spend on public services. I think that's perfectly sensible. But I want to get rid of the Maastricht um, drivers of our economy. The really, they were really the drivers of so-called austerity. It always struck me as a great irony that Labour and Liberal Democrats didn't like austerity, and yet they fully supported the Maastricht package, which was all about state debt as a percentage of GDP, and was all about the, the state deficit as a percentage of annual income. Uh, and they were driving down public spending and driving up tax revenue in order to try and meet the Maastricht criteria. Well, I say now we've left the EU, let's scrap the Maastricht criteria, and yet they're still in there, in the OBR, and, and they're still reporting against these Maastricht debt criteria. And I say, let's have a growth target instead. What do we need now to get the deficit down? We need more activity. We need people to earn more money. We need companies to make some profits. And then the taxes will come pouring in without raising the rates. Indeed, if you cut the rates a bit, they'll probably come pouring in even more because you'd get more more growth than well. I I, I know I know, Sir John. So that's... I want a, I want a better paid society, a lower yeah. tax rate society, which will bring the deficit down. Well, well, I know your mantra is go for growth, and uh, with you on that, I stand four square. Um, let's power through a couple of questions. Uh, the clock is against us, Sir John, but I really want to get to um, a couple of viewers' questions, including one from Joe, who says, Sir John, what is the rationale for Boris Johnson to follow France into introducing vaccine passports? Well, I think there are two different issues here, aren't there? Um, Domestically, I don't think we need vaccine passports, uh, and I trust we won't be introducing them. And I don't think there is any question of, of nationally agreed vaccine passports enforced by law or legislated for by Parliament, but I think they would be quite inappropriate. There's then the issue of what certification do you need to show if you're travelling abroad? And I think that's a more difficult thing, and that's why you do have to negotiate it with overseas countries anyway, because you may not get what you want, because if you want to go to France, you're going to have to play by it. The so on, on your watch, no vaccine passports in the UK for domestic use? No, I don't see the point of that. Um, I think it's a personal matter whether you've been vaccinated or not. And we now know that most people are vaccinated. So I don't really see what the problem is. And you are, you are close to the powers that be at number 10. Do you think it's unlikely that these COVID vaccine passports will happen? Do you think the appetite for them has diminished? Well, I hope so. I, I don't claim to be particularly close. I mean, I'm, I'm backbench MP and I have my voice. I, I normally put on my website what I think <laughs> and uh, try and persuade uh, those in government. And I think some private sector organisations and some entertainment venues and so forth will, will want to check up. Uh, and I have no problem with them doing that. And it may be reassuring to others who wouldn't otherwise go if going to be a big crowd unless there's that kind of thing. But I don't think it should be a mandatory legal requirement enforced by the state. Um, Sir John, we've got about 60 seconds left. So many brilliant questions. Uh, let's go rapid fire if we can. I know you're nimble footed enough to handle that. Clive wants to know, do you think Thatcher or Churchill would join today's Conservative Party? Lots of people have emailed in to say that they feel that you're a Conservative, but that the Conservative government has lost all of its values. Well, of course, Margaret Thatcher would, would join and she would want to change the policies in, in a number of ways. <laughs> Gary on email. She couldn't join Labour, could she? <laughs> well, no, that's a very good point. And, uh, and, 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 and I certainly accept that one. Um, would you ever consider running for the leadership of the Conservative Party again, asks Barbara. No, I'm not planning to run for the leadership of the Conservative Party, nor is there a vacancy. Uh, I'm supporting Mr Johnson, who I did vote for, and many of the members but of the party But, Sir did. John, you're, you're a lot younger than Donald Trump and a lot younger than Joe Biden. That is true. I'm obviously not old enough for politics yet, am I? I'm working on it. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. Um, another question from uh, Gary. Let's have a look at this one. Uh, what's your favourite type of music, Sir John? 
Oh, I, I like a lot of different types of music. Um, depends on the mood and, and what I'm doing. So I wouldn't want to just... Uh, it, what about genre? Is it classical? Is it pop? I mean, do you like the Beatles or the Stones? Yeah, I like some pop music. I like some classical music. I think I like a good tune. Yeah. It's, uh, it's uh, certainly a nice option. And Sam, on email, has Northern Ireland benefited from Brexit? No, and Northern Ireland is currently being harmed by Brexit because of the protocol, and that is what we spent the first part of this interview talking about. And I'm very strongly of the view that the government must now act unilaterally if the EU carries on doing the damage it's doing. Um, the Sun's political uh, columnist, Trevor Kavanagh, told me on this programme th three weeks ago, Sir John, he predicts a snap election in the next 12 to 18 months. Do you think that will happen? No, I don't think it will. So the Prime Minister goes full term, most likely? Well, who knows, four or five years. Um, I'm sure we'll restore the, the right of the Prime Minister with his cabinet to make the choice. Uh, and it, it could be a bit earlier than five years, but I, I can't see it happening in the next year or so. Welcome to the GB News YouTube channel. You can watch us live 24 hours a day, catch up on your favourite shows and join in the conversation in the comments below. Don't forget to subscribe and you'll never miss any of our exclusive content.